welcome to part two of macromolecules of the cell. We're going to dive right into proteins. Okay, a couple straight facts about proteins. Proteins are composed of a non-random series of amino acids. So they are built using a specific sequence to order the amino acids in the correct order. That this again this this will make a little bit more sense in a little bit when we get to more of the protein stuff. Again, and also proteins, like I said, a lot of times biochemistry and future courses are going to build a lot on this. Um, so you're going to see this a lot of this material more than once. Okay. Um, amino acid sequence is going to determine the three dimensional structure as well as the function of a protein. When we're making um, a protein, we start off with a single monomer, a single amino acid, and then we're going to string and add a bunch more onto that. Essentially, we create a line of all of these, a string of all of these monomers. And that is a polymer. Now, all of those individual amino acids, as you'll see in biochemistry, they have their own unique characteristics. Some of them are positively charged, some are negatively charged, some are polar, some are nonpolar, some have other stuff like sulfur or their higher energy, they like to bond to certain things. As a result, proteins fold. Once you build the whole chain, all of those different amino acids interact with one another. Kind of like you think of them, each one is like a different type of magnet with a different pull and a push in different directions. And so they all fold up together in a very specific way based on what it's, how it's built in order to create a three-dimensional shape. And that three-dimensional shape that it creates, as long as you know the, the sequence, the appropriate amino acids have been put all together, it folds into a protein, which then has a specific job. We'll go a little bit deeper into that in a couple of slides. So with 20 different amino acids, there are nearly infinite variety of protein sequences that are possible to make. So there's a bunch, a bunch of different proteins in our body. Some of the types of proteins, this is a great slide for pulling test questions out of because it's just straight definition type stuff. So enzymes, enzyme, anything that's like italicized, bolded, highlighted, anything like that. Focus on that kind of those kind of things for test questions, okay? Because oftentimes those are the easiest ones to um, write questions about. That's kind of a gross star. I'm gonna make a new one. Not much better, but it's okay. Enzymes. Enzymes are going to function what we call catalysts. They speed up the reaction. So catalysts speed up reactions by reducing the amount of energy needed for that reaction to happen. If we need less energy, it's more likely that we can make that that hap that reaction happen with um, with the resources that we have available. Um, even because if we didn't have the enzyme to help speed up the reaction, we would need a bunch more energy and it would take more time and different conditions for that to happen. So enzymes, we'll talk tons about enzymes in biochemistry. So it increases the rate of the chemical reactions. So it makes the reactions occur faster. Structural proteins, this is for physical support and shape. Lots of our body like in, in the skin and in between cells made up of a bunch of structural proteins. That's what keeps all of the stuff together. Motility proteins, contraction and movement. Stuff needs to get from one point to another inside of cells in order for our bodies to function. Stuff has to get from one place to another. So there are specific proteins that deal with that. Regulatory proteins control and coordinate cell function. Hormones and signaling molecules 
Again, we'll see these in biochemistry. Hormones, we're going to touch on them in this course as well as biochemistry. Again, briefly in Physiology 1 next trimester. And then a whole bunch in tries 3 and 4 and 5 in multiple courses. Okay? Right now, just understand, hey, hormones and signaling molecules, they help regulate the cell function. That's all we need to know at this point. Finally, transport proteins help move substances in and out of cells. Let me actually pull up quick little picture for you guys. When you see transport proteins, think about they're like little channels. Channels in that allow stuff to move in between layers of cells. Like every single cell has a phospholipid bilayer. That's like its exterior coating. Makes sure stuff, you know, isn't is contained within itself. Um, and there are these transporter proteins in order to allow stuff to go in and out of the cells. That we will touch a lot more on in Physiology 1. More, there are hormonal proteins, which we already kind of touched on with the regulatory proteins. There are receptor proteins, so stuff like hormones and other things that need to go to other cells. They need to bind to some kind of receptor in order to make things happen. So we have proteins that are receptors for that. Defensive proteins are our immune system. And then storage proteins, reservoirs of amino acids, so where we store stuff. Okay, the, this is perfect. Take each of these, throw these into, into a Quizlet, um, and review those. Um, so that way those are easy, easy test questions to answer. Amino acids. So a lot of this is again going to be covered in biochemistry. Let me show you. Oh, actually, this other picture is better. This is what an amino acid looks like. An amino acid has uh, four components to it. I will say five components. Okay. We have a carbon atom is the center, which is then known as a, we call it a chiral center that has a, it is bonded to a hydrogen. A chiral center is or I should say a chiral carbon center, is a carbon molecule that is bound to four unique slash different things. We know that we are carbon life forms. The reason why carbon is super good for life is because carbon has four electrons and it wants to have a full eight. So carbon is awesome for making lots of bonds. So a single carbon can bind four different things. And on all of our amino acids, we are going to see the following. We're going to see an amino group, also known as an amine. So this is a nitrogen that it's binding to. We have a carboxyl group. This is always a C double O H, technically also minus. So we have an amino group, a carboxyl group, a singular hydrogen, and then in a variable side chain also known as an R group. The R is 
a letter which represents um, something else. Think like X in math, in algebra. That's basically what the R is referring to. R is like, is um, like algebra R represents a whole other thing. If we look at actual amino acids, you know, we can see all of these in red here. These are those R groups. We look at each and every single one of these. The amine with the nitrogen, 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 nitrogen. We have the H, the H, the H, the H right there. And we have the carboxyl, C double bond, C double bondo, C double bondo. And then we have our, our, our R groups, R group, R group, R group. Our group just like that and that's for all of our amino acids when we talk about conjoining the amino acids we talk about them binding together so amino acids again these are our monomers they all bind together to form a polymer they're linked by a type of bond, a covalent bond, called a peptide bond. This is formed between the amine group of one amino acid and the carboxyl group of the next amino acid. So we look at this right here. Remember what we talked about with terminus? The amino or the N terminus here on the left, and then the carboxyl or C terminus on the right. So you we can say proteins are built N terminus to C terminus. Proteins. One thing you'll learn about me is I like spell check. I'm not a, the best speller. <clears throat> so there we have it. That's how these get joined together. Uh, continuing monomeric and multimeric proteins. So proteins that consist of a single polypeptide chain. I'm going to add a couple things in here first. Um, I'm going to add a new slide here. So when a bunch of amino acids get joined together, this is known as a polypeptide chain. A polypeptide chain is the first step in creating a protein. This is also known as the protein's primary structure. So we have a polymer, we have a chain, right? And I'm actually going to re-add this slide, okay? So we have a primary structure. Now I mentioned earlier, right, that that whole chain, that reaction altogether, each of those individual components has a different piece to it, and they're gonna, in, or a different composition to it and different properties with it. So they are going to fold. Let me see. Okay. So that primary protein structure, one polypeptide chain, and nothing else. 
the bonds are peptide bonds, aka covalent bonds. Um, this is an extra little tidbit. There is a specific amino acid called cysteine that has sulfur, which can also do a different kind of bond called a sulfur bond. I don't want to get too deep into that right now. Don't worry about that too, too much. You'll, that will, the horse will be beaten in biochemistry as well. So I'm not too worried about that right here, right now. Right, so we have our peptide bonds. We have our chain structure. Now all these are going to interact with each other and the, they are going to, um, let me, this slide is in a yucky place. I'm going to put this down by quaternary structure, which we will get to in a sec. I don't know why this slide is all the way up here though. I want it there, good. <clears throat> okay, so like I said, we're going to get folding of stuff. We have primary structure, we're gonna go to a secondary and we'll have a tertiary and a quaternary type structure. So we have our polypeptide chain held together by peptide bonds, AKA covalent bonds. Now, all of those are going to now fold. So we have the properties of the amino acids will interact with one another and the protein and the polypeptide chain will fold. <clears throat> and this is determined by hydrogen bonding within the polypeptide. So the whole thing, because remember we have all those extra hydrogens. So we look up here and you know we had the hydrogen there, hydrogen there, hydrogen there, hydrogen coming off. There are lots of spots for f hydrogen that's free in order that it can bind to other stuff. So it's through hydrogen bonds that we have secondary protein structure. Um, a couple little tidbits here. We have what are called, um, there are, I should say, there are specific shapes that we get with binding. So literally, so the, um, the folding of the polypeptide chain will take the shape of either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Those are the two shapes that it can take. So we'll have um, an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. So anytime you see somebody talking about secondary protein structure, look for alpha helix or beta pleated sheet, okay? Always, 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 those are pretty much the only answers you're going to get with secondary structure. Now, with secondary structure, sure that this is in the correct order as I describe it. Let me double check one thing real quick. Okay, good. 
making sure that the, the slides are in the correct order. So motifs, this is a part of our secondary structure. That's what I was confirming. Part of secondary structure. So when we get the folding and we get these alpha helixes or these beta sheets, when we talk about you know a single polypeptide chain can be really 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 long. So you can have I'm going to new blank slide. You can have a polypeptide chain. Let's say this is the polypeptide chain. We just finished making it perfect. There's a picture, there's, imagine there's a bunch of amino acids all along this, all connected, right? And once it's formed, you start to get secondary structure. And you can get alpha helices or beta pleated sheets in different parts of the same polypeptide chain. So we say we have this polypeptide chain. Let's say this first part wants to make an alpha helix. Good, and then the next part, the way that the amino acids, it wants to form a beta pleated sheet. And then the next part wants to form an alpha helix, just like that. Or even, you know, you could have something like a super long alpha helix and then a beta pleated sheet. And then alpha helix, beta pleated sheet, like that. So you get multiple of the different shapes along one really long polypeptide chain. <clears throat> and with that, you get you tend to get certain patterns or combinations. So certain combinations or patterns of alpha helices or and beta pleated sheets have been found in many different proteins. So these units of secondary structure consist of short stretches of alpha helices and beta sheets and are known as motifs. So some of the examples that we see, we have what are called there's three of them. The one that gets most tested on is this one. Examples include, so it's the beta, alpha, beta, another one called the hairpin loop, and then the helix turn helix motifs. So right here we see the beta, alpha helix, beta motif. So beta, alpha helix beta alpha beta so it'll form this kind of structure a hairpin loop which is two beta pleated sheets or the helix turn helix so two different separate alpha helixes making a turn okay you don't necessarily need to know all of the super specifics but you need to recognize this terminology okay know what a motif is and recognize, you know, beta alpha beta, hairpin loop, and helix turn helix are examples of that motif. Okay? And that is the end of secondary structure. Tertiary structure, once all of the secondary structures have occurred, things are still going to interact with one another. Okay? So the tertiary structure reflects the unique aspect of the amino acid sequence because it depends on the interactions specifically of the R groups. Tertiary structure is neither repetitive nor easy to predict. Essentially, we get a bunch of these motifs, everything folds all together, and then think bigger picture. So we zoom back in. I'm going a little bit slow on this, but that's because a lot of test questions tend to come from this. And we see it again in biochemistry, so I wanna make sure that you really, really understand this now. So primary structure, we have our chain, everything 
all together. Secondary structure to that chain interacts with itself and you get alpha helices or beta pleated sheets or you get those motifs and then once that's have been all folded the whole protein that those alpha helices the beta pleated sheets all of those guys interact with one another and continue to fold and that is our tertiary structure so it's the sum so the R groups on the amino acids give the different properties to the amino acids like I said I was saying before some are polar some are nonpolar some are hydrophilic some are hydrophobic some are more positive some are more negative etc etc so due to all of those interactions because of the R groups in you know all of those secondary structures now it's going to continue to fold and we get a folding of a tertiary structure of the protein. This is a ribonuclease. This is just an example of tertiary structure. Now, the tertiary structure, I'm going to add another slide into here. So a protein can be completed in tertiary structure. So you can have a tertiary structure that is a complete protein. You know, it's folded up and it's able to function and it's able to do its job the way that it's that it that it wants to okay so protein can be completed in tertiary structure or it can continue on and combine with other tertiary structures to form larger proteins which we'll look at in one second before we look at that, we want to talk about something called domains. So within the tertiary structure, you can have different parts of the same protein all um, let me make sure I describe this appropriately. Different chunks or different parts of the amino acid or of the polypeptide chain are going to kind of fold and be kind of like a, a subunit of the whole of the protein as a whole. Okay. So right here it says the tertiary structure of proteins, especially large proteins containing more than 200 residues. That's residue is a fancy way of saying amino acids or monomers. So residues equals amino acids equals monomers. It's just more science speak. It says frequently consists of several domains or compact units that are connected by short peptide chains. These domains are relatively independent of other domains and may exhibit different biological activities. So this saying, in some, not all proteins, um, you can have these subunits. So this one right here has has its own function slash job. And then we look at this. this chunk right here does a different job and so when the blue one does its own job the orange part does its own bod job it's all one big protein but you have these different kind of these different subunits called domains 
that allow it to do different jobs. <clears throat> this is just that example, domain 1, domain 2, glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase is a single polypeptide folded into two domains. This is just um, showing the overall, the general structure, the tertiary protein structure, polypeptide bond. You have all the different types of bonds. You can have disulfide, hydrogen, uh, ionic, and van der Waals and hydrophobic interreactions. Um, <clears throat> it's held together primarily by hydrogen bonds but all of these are included. This is typically some kind of test question. Um, the types of bonds in each of these um, is often tested on. So let me actually add in, I'm gonna jump ahead, jump after quaternary structure and I'll, I'll add this in because I think it's very, very important. So primary, so structure step and bond type. Primary is covalent peptide bonds. Secondary is hydrogen bonds. Tertiary is sulfide slash hydrogen slash ionic slash van der Waals forces. Two A's, not two L's. Quaternary is again hydrogen bonds. And I will double check that. So we have those disulfide bonds, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and hydrophobic interactions. Most often, these are the four. These ones are the ones you get tested on. Um, you'll get tested on the connection of each of these. So primary structure being covalent peptide bonds, secondary structure being hydrogen bonds, tertiary being this whole list. Oftentimes you'll have a multiple choice question that's like with tertiary bonds, which of the following is not um, involved? And it'll give some kind of other type of bond. It'll have, you know, hydrogen, van der Waals, hydrophobic interactions, ionic, and then another choice that's like, not, that's not one of these. Or it'll be like all of the above are um, involved with tertiary type bonding. So there are each of those different kinds of structures. And this is also a question that we'll get asked in biochemistry one as well. Okay, now, like I said, tertiary structures can be the end. You can have a tertiary structure and be done, or you can add several different structures together, okay? Proteins that are of a single polypeptide chain are monomeric proteins, complete in tertiary form but you can also have multimeric proteins, which consist of two or more polypeptide chains. These are our quaternary proteins. Basically, all that's saying is we will form multiple tertiary proteins, and then those tertiary proteins come together, and they all fit together into an even larger protein being a quaternary protein. Proteins consisting of two or three polypeptides are known as dimers or trimers. So if we have two chains, they're a dimer. Three, they're a trimer. 
hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is always asked about all the time. Because hemoglobin is super, super important in the body, and it's a unique one. It is a tetramer consisting of two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. This is almost always, always asked. So there's four total, two alpha, two beta subunits of for, for hemoglobin. Here's the actual talking about quaternary stru structure. The quaternary structure of a protein is the level of organization concerned with subunit interactions and assembly. It supply, applies specifically to the multimeric proteins. Multiple polypeptide chains come together. Some proteins consist of multiple identical subunits. Others, like hemoglobin, contain two or more types of polypeptides. Remember, hemoglobin has two beta and two alpha. These, again, these are the kind of questions. These are like the easy, easy, straightforward test questions. You just have to know that specific fact. This is an example of hemoglobin, two beta, two alpha, right there. Getting into a little bit of pathology, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is an inherited red blood cell disorder where normal red blood cells are round, kind of like donuts, like little intertubes, and they are able to move through the blood vessels and deliver body to deliver oxygen to the body. Um, essentially, there's a mutation in the actual DNA itself. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail than what's absolutely necessary, um, but it's in the future you're gonna see a lot on sickle cell so I don't feel bad being redundant with it so with sickle cell anemia essentially there is a mutation in the hemoglobin beta gene found on chromosome 11 um, if you get this mutation from both parents, that is what is known as sickle cell anemia. This is the disease. If you get the mutation from one parent, that is what is known as sickle cell trait. Um, not great, but not life threatening like the disease. Um, makes you more resistant slash immune to malaria. I'll explain that real quick. So <clears throat> with sickle cell, because of the mutation on the chromosome, that codes for the building of red blood cells. Basically, your your blood doesn't produce the cells appropriately. And so they become hard, sticky, shaped like sickles. So they shape um, kind of sharp and just different components. And when these blood cells go down the small blood vessels that go into the capillaries, they can get stuck. They can hit the edge. They can get stuck. They can break apart, which causes pain, damage. Um, as well as your body then finds these cells and breaks them down. So you get anemia or low red blood cell count in the body. Um, it is a genetic disease due to this mutation. Um, 
it's not mentioned in this PowerPoint, but you will see it in the future. So something called sickle cell trait. This is actually why, so sickle cell is very, very common in Africa. Um, and even in African American communities, African American people are more likely to have sickle cell anemia. And that is actually because having this mutation on one part of the chromosome, 11, gives you your makes your blood vessels slightly irregular let me see if i can find a picture sickle cell trait so instead of being you know your whole blood all of your blood being jacked up just some of it is so you have these sickle cells so and this is actually beneficial for survival because it means malaria, which is a disease that travels into the blood and binds to red blood cells. Malaria has a much harder time to t taking root in somebody with sickle cell trait. So that's why in a lot of parts of Africa, especially ones where mosquito populations are dense or malaria is endemic in that area, people with sickle cell trait tend to recover from malaria and survive a lot better. So it's actually beneficial to have a sickle cell trait. Okay, last part on proteins. Um, there's two different shapes of proteins. So the shapes of proteins fall into two different categories. This is, again, heavily tested. You will have probably two or three questions coming from these slides right here on your tests. Um, you have fibrous proteins, which are structural proteins. They are strand-like, water-insoluble, meaning they do not dissolve in water, and they are stable. Most have tertiary or quaternary structure. They provide mechanical support and tensile strength. Examples are keratin, which is in your skin, elastin, collagen, collagen being the single most abundant protein in your body, and then certain contractile fibers. Know everything on this slide. If you know, you, if you know everything on this slide, that's free points. They almost always ask about them being water soluble or insoluble. They like to ask about the examples as well are the popular ones. Globular or functional proteins, these are compact, spherical, water soluble, and sensitive to environmental change. They have tertiary or quaternary structure, specific functional regions, so they have what are called active sites. These are the proteins that are gonna be traveling around doing the different things that they're supposed to be doing. So the antibodies, the hormones, the molecular chaperones, the enzymes, all of these guys, honestly, that you don't really need to know the chaperone part. That's meh. But antibodies, hormones, and enzymes. There's the collagen, and there is the globular protein, like myoglobin. So no, no, absolutely no, these structures. Okay, this that chunk was a little bit longer than I would have liked to. But I think it's important, you know, to take a little bit of time, to take our time through this. Make sure you get all of the information. This was part two. In the next video, part three, we will start to dive into lipids and we'll see exactly, um, again, we might need a, a part four after that. Thank you so much for watching. Again, if you have any questions, leave them down below. Um, in the comments as well, leave a like on the video. Um, it helps to let people, other people know kind of what these videos are all about. Um, and I promise you that, that going through all this material like this is going to help a lot um, in the long run.